Okay, recreating the American Rifleman. I'm sorry, the American Long Hunter. Now this is not in chapters, it's different, it's in sections. And they're pretty long, so I'll just, I'll try to stay within the 10 minutes I like to keep them. And um, we'll figure it out. Okay, this is In Search of Land and Fur. The identity of the long hunter. Okay. This chapter deals with who the long hunters were and how they lived. I define a long hunter as a man who lived on the western frontier of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, or the Carolinas, and who supplemented his income and diet by hunting, usually for periods of several months or more. Not that long hunters didn't originate from any of the other colonies or states. But the frontiers of these five were closest in proximity to the prime hunting grounds in Kentucky and Ohio. The long hunts came about because of this proximity. As the Kentucky and Ohio territories began to fill with settlers after the revolution, the long hunts essentially ceased. First because living in the midst of the hunting grounds, the frontiersmen didn't need to travel as far for game and later because they spent more and more time farming and raising livestock as the game in these areas became depleted. Another contemporary term for these men was backwoodsmen, an epithet we shall see quoted in a later chapter. For the purposes of this book, I shall be using the terms long hunter, frontiersman, and backwoodsman more or less interchangeably. In dealing with their home environment, I realized that what follows must be considered a generalization. Communities varied not only between colonies or states, but communities themselves. I'm sorry, uh, or colonies or states, but communities themselves changed from year to year. I make no apologies for generalizing, but leave it up to you to learn the particulars of your chosen time and place. The frontier community consisted primarily of independent farmers with perhaps a few tradesmen if the, if the community was large enough to support them. For instance, William Bean, one of the first white settlers in the Watauga, one of the first white settlers on the Watauga near what is now Johnson City, Tennessee, was not only a long hunter and friend of Daniel Boone, but a gunsmith and a miller as well. His estate at the time of his death in 1782 included 400 acres of land, a grist mill, some livestock, and at least one slave. Prior to the Revolution, the Valley of Virginia boasted several distilleries, wineries, at least four furnaces or ironworks, and one or more armories or gunneries. These latter were supported more by the surrounding frontier than by any single community, as the valley also contained a major north-south wagon route. America, particularly the frontier, required more self-sufficiency of its citizens than Europeans had ever before experienced. By the mid-18th century, the frontier had become the breeding ground of a new type of man, one who considered himself the equal of any other regardless of social station or wealth. J.F.D. Smith who kept a journal of his travels in the early 1770s, commented on that sense of self-worth when he reported that the backwoodsman held himself to be of equal consequence to the most brilliant peer at St. James. Hmm. To the Europeans for whom Smith was writing, the statement that a ragged, penniless, ill-bred, uneducated backwoods lout would consider himself the equal of one of the peerage would be received with astonishment, not to mention amusement. So he went on to say that it was neither so ridiculous nor surprising when the circumstances are considered with due attention, that he feels his own consequence for he finds all his resources himself, meaning that he was totally self-sufficient. We remember the long hunters for their exploits on the hunt but the fact is a few were so skilled that they could live off profits of their hunting alone. And it was rare to find a man whose sole occupation was that of a hunter. 
Game was an essential part of the diet and skins a good supplement to one's income on the frontier. The Reverend Dr. Joseph Doddridge, in his memoirs of the years 1763 to 1783 in Western Virginia and Pennsylvania, wrote, Every family collected what peltry and fur they could obtain through the year for the purpose of sending them over the mountains, over the mountains for barter. Long hunters are also remembered for their dealings with the Indians, but also, but although frontiersmen may have occasionally traded with friendly Indians of the opportunity, I'm sorry, I messed that up. But although frontiersmen may have occasionally traded with friendly Indians if the opportunity presented itself, the Indian trade itself fairly, the Indian trade itself fairly well precluded being a long hunter. A man investing in trade goods doesn't risk the wrath of his customers by violating their territory to hunt for the very skins and furs he came to buy. If so, why bother with the investment in the first place? Such an investment, even on credit, was beyond the means of most frontiersmen. For those with the means, a loss of trade goods to hostile Indians or to those individuals, either red or white, who would prevent him from trading with friendly tribes often meant ruin. George Krogan was possibly the most well-known Indian trader of the 18th century. By the time he was done with the trade, he estimated his losses at 16,000. Uh, that's either pounds or lira. I'm not sure how they put that. By the time he was done, he was in debt. It should be obvious by now that I want to dispel the myth that the long hunters spent all their time hunting or among the Indians. Those whom we remember best as long hunters, i.e. Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton, the Cresaps and the Gists, or Gists, were primarily farmers and to a slightly lesser extent cattlemen and herdsmen. Hunting, let's see, hunting and exploring were essential sidelines and dealings with Indians were more often than not of a hostile nature. The point is, if you want to portray a believable long hunter, you should know something about farming. What follows is a thumbnail sketch. Again, particulars will vary with your time, location, and station in life. The type of farming practiced in 18th century backcountry America can be best described as hoe agriculture. That would be different today of using that word, hoe agriculture. Plows were available either imported or of domestic manufacture but they were not common on the frontier. First of all, a frontiersman's fields would be previously uncultivated and filled with rocks and tree stumps. Even if he could afford a plow, he'd have a tough time using it, but his crops didn't really need a plow for cultivation. The most important subsistent crop, subsistence crop was Indian corn. To the 18th century European, the word corn by itself meant wheat and it was planted in mounds with hoes, Indian fashion, as were pumpkins, squashes, beans, and potatoes. Tobacco was also an important crop in the middle colonies, although less so on the frontier. To plant it with any hopes of making a crop, a man had to be relatively safe from Indian attack, and he had no time for such things as hunting. This was because of tobacco's need for almost constant year-round care. With most crops, the harvest completed the cycle and the farmer was relatively free for the winter. With tobacco, proper, proper drying and curing required almost as much attention as growing the plant itself. Like corn, tobacco was planted in mounds and needed no plow. In the Valley of Virginia, hemp and wheat were the primary money crops prior to the revolution, but raising either required little soil preparation or cultivation using the farm using the farming methods of the period. The bottom line is that a plow was simply unnecessary on the frontier and it remained so until fields had been sufficiently cleared to permit its use and the farmer considered the expense justifiable. Being a farmer on the frontier meant that a man had to be at home in the spring to get his crops in the ground and remain there until the harvest, until the harvest in early fall. It was only when the leaves were pretty well down and the weather became rainy, accompanied by light snows, these men, after acting the part of husbandmen, so far as the state of warfare permitted them to do so, soon began to feel that they were hunters. 
While they might be away for a few months, planned journeys of a year or more were unusual. This did happen, of course, particularly in time of war. George Rogers Clark's expedition to Vincennes and Cascasia is one example. But a man would take the care of his farm into account in the planning of such a journey. A man gone over a year without having made prior arrangements for his farm was usually presumed captured or killed. All, all, all this is not to belittle the role of the hunter. To the man's just starting to work a newly required, I'm sorry, a newly acquired plot of ground, hunting was in fact essential. Doddridge mentions that peltry and furs were the only resources before they had time to raise cattle and horses for sale in the Atlantic states and that they had nothing else to give in exchange for rifles, salt, and iron on the other side of the mountains. We're going to leave that right there. Love you. God bless.